Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, uh, my name's Taylor. Uh, I'm from Agrisi. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be up here speaking today. Um, as Claire said, uh, two months, um, but it's nice to see some youth in the industry. Uh, over the last three days, uh, there's been a lot of talk about it, you know, the youth in the workforce, and I think it's evident um, in the agriculture sector. Um, but I feel privileged because there's a wealth of knowledge here. Um, it's incredible. But, but I'm a research technician at Agrisi, um, and I'm here to talk about uh, the Hauraki Bioremediation Project. Uh, first of all, I'd like to touch on the photo here. Um, I've got a couple of logos up, ours and the University of Waikato. Um, it's been a massive collaborative effort to get this uh, site set up into where it is today. Um, in the background there's a van, uh, it's a bit hard to see, but it's a University of Waikato van there. Uh, Chris Blake, the technician in charge of setting up the project, spent long days and late nights there. That's not a sunrise, that's a sunset. Uh, he then had to drive all the way back to Tauranga, which is about three hours away. Um, so our site is located uh, in the mouth of the Waiho River uh, in the Waikato region, uh, right at the base of the Firth of Thames. Uh, I want to put emphasis on the photo behind the riding there. Uh, most of you will know the Blue Springs, beautiful crystal clear waters. Uh, that is the headwaters of the Waiho River. Um, the, uh, just about the entire watershed uh, is farmland, all the way down from Putaruru up to uh, the Firth of Thames there. So this next photo will give you a great comparison of um, what happens to the water as it makes its way down. Um, so yep, nutrient pollution. Um, it's a major problem in uh, New Zealand rivers and lakes, freshwater systems. Uh, in the background you can see the darker water there. That's uh, more of a freshwater input. Um, it looks pretty scummy. Um, the water in front is the, the uh, seawater pushing up the mouth. Uh, it's not a whole lot better. Um, but yeah, so <clears throat> our project aim here um, to bioremediate nutrient-rich brackish uh, water. Um, it's quite hard to see, but uh, about 300 metres down from my site, uh, there's a tidal gate. Um, and if you'll notice, there's not a whole lot of water around there. Um, it's about 200 metres from the edge of the river. Um, I pump at high tides uh, to try and ensure that I'm getting saline water. Um, it is just a mangrove forest. At low tide, there is no water there whatsoever. Uh, it's also important to note that um, there's a wastewater treatment plant just behind me, uh, and the outflow is 200 metres upstream as well. Um, so there's a photo of Claire uh, with her hands in the tank, playing with seaweed. I love the look on her face. Pure passion. Um, this is a similar species to what we use. Um, and this is at the Coastal Marine Field Station in Tauranga, uh, managed by the University of Waikato. Um, so they've developed um, the system here, uh, where they're growing ulva in salinity ranging from 5 ppt all the way up to 45 ppt. Uh, we chose the species because it's fast growing um, and it has great bioremediation potential. Um, it also has um, commercial application uh, in um, biostimulants, um, you can extract a whole lot of other things out of it. Uh, there's um, cyanide working on a protein-based derivative, you can pull olivins out of it, salts, um, and potential for nanocellulose as well. Um, so as part of normal growth, uh, olva assimilates nitrogen and phosphorus into its tissue. Um, so we're kind of trying to tackle the issue of uh, this excess nutrient in our river systems from both ends, right? So we're trying to pull some of that excess nutrients out, um, which are from conventional farming, uh, using the inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus, um, and then also being able to manufacture the ulva into a biostimulant um, to reduce the need for those nitri nitrogen and phosphorus-based fertilizers. Um, so again, I've got the University of Waikato logo up there. Again, I want to emphasise that it has been a massive team effort. Um, on the left, we've got uh, Chris Glassens uh, and then Marie Magnusson, um, the algal scientists in charge uh, at Waikato of developing uh, the system there. And then Claire and Tane on the right. And I love the expressions on their faces. You know, they're passionate, they're happy. The potential for development with this product is huge. Uh, Chris Blake, who I mentioned in the beginning on the left there, uh, in the latter stages of setting up the site, uh, you can see in the background uh, the massive wastewater treatment plant uh, there. So it, it is huge scale, it services the entire Thames area. 
Uh, I also just want to um, take a minute to mention the mural on my container. It's a, it's a bit random because we're obviously not in the public view there. Um, we want to be able to use this space as an educational um, space for school groups uh, and alike um, to try and build that youthfulness in the industry, if you will. Um, so <clears throat> Wayne talked earlier a bit about the uh, bioremediation of the prawn farm effluence. Um, it's also used in uh, abalone farms as well. Uh, but this is the first diffuse source seaweed bioremediation facility in New Zealand and potentially the world. Um, but again, like everyone in aquaculture talks about, it hasn't come without challenges. Um, I have massive salinity fluctuations because I'm on the edge of a river. Uh, in the last month, uh, the flow of water has tripled. Uh, so it's pushing that uh, tidal bulge further out into the firth um, and I ended up with a massive influx of freshwater algae in my tank. Uh, yes, ouch. It, it was pretty drastic. I spent two days away and then came back and was just like, wow, that is wild. Um, as well as the uh, freshwater input, uh, the tidal fluctuation is massive um, at the mouth of the Waiho River. Uh, I get 2.8 metre high tides and then the week after I get 3.5 metre high tides. Uh, so I'm working on float switches and you can imagine that over a metre of variation uh, isn't very friendly on uh, float switches. Uh, and I had to put this one in here for comparison. That was 10 minutes later after I water blasted it and cleaned it. So <laughs> you can see it's pretty drastic. Um, so we haven't actually started the experiment. Uh, we had uh, Ngāti Hako come and bless our site um, and we wanted to sort of show the potential for it there. Um, and then I decided that we should leave the biomass in the tank so that if there's any hurdles, I can flatten them before we start the experiment. And again, there were many hurdles. Uh, so the left photo, uh, two weeks of growth, right? I had massive rainfall for those first two weeks. Uh, you can see it's not very green at all. Um, there's massive contamination in there. Um, and I want to take note uh, of the fish bin on the left, right? It's, it's not even covering the bottom of it. Two weeks later, wow. the seaweed on the right. I started with 330 grams. After the first two weeks, it uh, was about a kilo, but again, the contamination was extensive. Two weeks after that, so four weeks in, I've got just over eight kilos. Uh, so the growth rates of the ulva are insane, and look at how lush and green it is. If that wastewater treatment plant wasn't upstream, I probably would have put some in my mouth by now. It just, it looks delicious. It's so vibrant. Um, and so <clears throat> on this pilot scale, um, I've got 60 square meters of um, surface area in my tanks, uh, which can produce, the, the ulva can produce roughly 15 grams of dried ulva per meter squared per day. Uh, that roughly equates to 900 grams a day across my entire pilot study, um, which, there's some big numbers there, 328 kilograms of dry biomass per year, um, just in my tiny little facility there with those three uh, high-rate algal ponds. Um, assuming that uh, in a nutrient replete system, uh, roughly four to five percent of the biomass uh, is translatable into nitrogen, there's quite a lot of nitrogen removal there. Uh, assuming that nitrogen credits um, are rolled out annually, uh, and also assuming they fetch for roughly $30 a kilo, um, the University of Waikato have put out some estimates uh, for upscaling the project, which it is easily upscaled, but at the moment there is a lot of, uh, a lot of work behind it, a lot of maintenance, still hurdles to get through. Um, so you can see there 58, 4.8 tonnes of dry biomass per year, 12 tonnes of nitrogen, and some massive numbers there as well. Oh, hello. Uh, I want to take this uh, time to thank our sponsors and our supporters, our Ministry of Primary Industries, Agmart and Agrisea funding it, um, and everyone else around it supporting it. Um, again, collaboration is key for things like this, and um, we couldn't have done it without um, our partners here. <laughs>